she um, okay <laughs> um, Diane is a, an historian who did her doctorate at Carleton University and graduated in um, 1988 with um, yes. a degree in history and she had a special interest in women's history so she's done a lot of um, publishing in areas such as birth control health and domestic technology. She also worked for over 25 years at Parks Canada, where she did research and wrote uh, mm -hmm. plaque texts. That's hard to say, plaque texts for the federal commemor commemorative program. After retirement, Diane continued her research and she wrote about women's history. In, in 2020, she published 100 years, our um, 100 years, the Canadian Federation of University Women. We're very pleased Diane is here with us tonight, today, uh, to talk about the long history of CFUW and um, why we should be proud of this organization that has offered friendship and community engagement and lifelong learning to generations of women. So here's Diane. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to do my share screen and hope this works. Great. Can everyone see it? Yes. Mm. Good yes, for you. Great. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I think this is about the third time now that I've made a presentation on uh, on the, the history of CFUW from the book. And um, I just wanted to make a comment at the beginning um, when we did our little introductory thing to get used to the technology. Um, Val had asked me how I got interested in women's history, which is it's a good question. So I thought I'd answer it. Um, to make a long story short, um, in 1975, when the UN decided to declare it um, International Women's Year, I was quite young and uh, impressionable. And uh, that, um, that year uh, really introduced me to feminism. So when I began studying history at university, I wondered uh, where all the women were. And apparently I was not alone. There was a group of uh, dynamic women professors uh, like Ruth Pearson, Deborah Gorham, Alison Prentice, who was uh, in the, uh, the West, some of whom I had the privilege of studying under. They, anyway, they started doing a, a critique of uh, the way history had been done up to that point, which um, had really spent too much time paying attention to men and particularly elite men. So women's history uh, sort of gradually got started uh, in those early years when I was studying. And um, I have to say at the beginning, male historians were extremely um, dismissive of women's history. They called it a fad. They said uh, it would never last, blah, blah, blah. But in time, uh, it did get accepted. And now it's very difficult to even do history without considering gender. So that's kind of progress. Anyway, I combined my feminism with my academic interests, and um, the result was I specialized in women's history. Um, I, I also want to say, because I, I um, joined CFUW just uh, recently, just before the pandemic, actually, um, and uh, I often get asked about trailblazers. Um, and I just want to say that I don't really equate women's history with the history of trailblazers um, because, you know, elite women doing something for the very first time is um, often interesting, but not always really important. What is important is the impact of what you do do and how that um, gets translated into to social change. And I think we also need to acknowledge um, the collective as well as the um, um, individual achievements of women in the past, from the past. So I'll begin with a roadmap of what I'm going to say, because um, apparently you're supposed to do that if you're a teacher, and I know that a lot of a lot of you are former teachers. Um, first, I want to look at the early educational leaders, some of whom founded clubs and then i'll look at the federation secondly the um, scholarship program that they began 
and how this uh, gradually evolved into an advocacy program for women. Because one thing did lead to another. Finally, um, I'm going to look a bit at how um, CFUW fostered political leadership among <laughs> women members. Um, incidentally, I, um, I uh, asked for a copy of your banner and I'm including it with my visuals just to make everybody feel um, included. And I do use a few uh, examples of women from DC but they, they also represent national trends, so they're not anomalies. Um, and again, I, I just want to emphasize that I, I like to think of um, the historic achievements of CFUW as collective rather than individual, even though I sometimes use, use individual women to uh, highlight points. Um, oh, I need to change the slide. So let's start with the educational founders. And I put founders in italics here, or in um, quotation marks, because uh, they were more inspirational founders rather than actual club founders. The club founders came, uh, were sort of a, a generation or two later, not the first generation of university women students, um, but they took a lot of inspiration from those early women. One of them was Elizabeth Smith Short, who um, he, uh, later became an Ottawa club member. She had to brave ridicule and abuse at the Queen's University School of Medicine uh, in her efforts to become a doctor. And she also left an important um, document, a diary documenting her experience, which makes very interesting reading. In fact, the male students and the faculty threatened to quit en masse if the women weren't barred from attending medical school, the medical school. And as a result, um, separate women's colleges had to be founded for female students wanting to study medicine. Smith was brave, no doubt, but there were also other factors leading to um, or pushing women into higher education. Here's a woman I'm sure you'll recognize, um, Evelyn uh, uh, Ferris from Acadia. Religion was, was a major factor uh, in, in um, propelling women into higher education. In Eastern Canada, several institutions affiliate, which were affiliated with progressive um, evangelical, evangelical churches were the first to open their doors to women students. And that happened in the 70s, 1870s and 1880s. But their goal was not to train women to compete uh, with men in professions like medicine. It was to, be, uh, to train them to be good moral and spiritual guides for their children and um, families. Um, and as I say, here is uh, Evelyn uh, Kerstad Ferris. She attended Acadia, which was a progressive uh, Baptist college in Nova Scotia, where her father taught. Uh, he had a lot of influence over her, uh, Reverend Miles Kerstad. He believed that men and women were equal in God's eyes and that higher education would help women to better mold the minds of young children. Margaret Addison attended the Methodist uh, College, uh, Victoria College in Coburg in 1885, before it became part of UT. Her father was a pastor with ties to the college, and he had secured her admittance to the college. When she was there, she didn't feel she was a trailblazer. She felt she was not doing anything that unusual. Because both her parents believed that although for women families should come first if there were no husband who came along then a woman should be able to uh to earn a living and that was often as a teacher the country was modernizing at this time and school attendance was growing and as we all know only too well school boards soon discovered that they could pay women less than men to teach addison's career reflected this she became a high school teacher, and later she became Dean of Women at U of T, 
and she presided over this lovely building in Ansley Hall. She, there she was tasked with guiding the uh, growing number of young women attending university at which, you know, went from an all-male institution to co-ed. And of course, at that time, it was considered a grave moral danger for young women to be in co-ed environments, so she was supposed to protect them. Um, interestingly, this was a role that was held by many early CFUW presidents, that of Dean of Women. A lot of the early presidents were academics. Mary Bollert uh, from uh, UBC played a sing similar role, and you, you may know about her, I don't know. Um, by the way, for, I know um, uh, you're always looking for good books to read, and there is an excellent biography written on um, Margaret Al Allison that I, I would recommend. Here's another familiar face, I'm sure. Helen Gregory McGill. She was the first woman to take music at the new program at Trinity College, also in Toronto. She graduated in 1886 and later earned um, a bachelor and then a master's of arts degree. Also typical for these early women, she had help from her uh, family in, in gaining admittance. Her grandfather was a prominent uh, jurist and petitioned the university on her behalf. But she didn't blaze trails in music. She became a self-taught legal reformer and did a lot in um, uh, uh, legal reforms for women. Let's, um, let's take a look now at the um, early um, clubs, the formation of the early clubs, which were the precursor to the Federation. Um, Young women who went to university really cherished their time there. They wanted to keep learning and to keep up the friendships with um, other educated women that they had formed. Um, so after they graduated, they started to form clubs. Uh, Mabel Chown helped form the Toronto Club in 1903. Later in the 1930s, she also became president um, of the CFUW after she moved west. And here's Evelyn Ferris again. She founded the um, uh, Vancouver University Women's Club in 1907 after moving there with her um, husband from the Atlantic region. Like many founders, uh, Ferris was looking for uh, community engagement, but also friends. Uh, she wanted to make new friends. Ferris also encouraged the um, uh, formation of the uh, Victoria Club uh, a year later in 1908, with Rosalind Young as its first president. After that came Madge Watt, who um, brought the Women's Institutes to uh, Britain and then later founded the Associated Country Women of the World in uh, the 1930s. And she was designated as a um, person of national historic significance. When Ferris came to BC, there was still no university. That was the case in much of the West uh, because it was uh, settled by Europeans much later than um, uh, the rest of uh, the rest of Canada. So it was a different situation for for women in universities there. Um, she, Ferris, that is, and Rosalind Young worked with um, the clubs in both Victoria and uh, Vancouver to help make UBC a reality. Young crafted or drafted the legislation that formed the university and she ensured that women were eligible for roles on um, the Senate uh, on equal terms with men, at least um, at least on paper. Um, both Ferris and Young, interestingly, believed in the art of quiet influence, that is advocating for legislation behind the scenes through the influential men that they knew, in this case, their husbands. Ferris's religious upbringing had imbued her with a sense of the near sacred duty of wife and mother. 
and she did not believe in women taking an active part in politics. She was also very interested in law and studied it um, at university, but she felt there could be only one practicing uh, lawyer in the family, so she de deferred to her husband. Here she is a little older with um, uh, Helen Gregory McGill again. Ferris also worked with uh, McGill and the Vancouver Club to advocate reforms to laws pertaining to women and children. McGill taught her, taught her she was a journalist before she um, came to Vancouver and she taught herself law um, and was a major uh, critic of married women's laws as well as custodianship laws that recognized only the father um, and through the leadership of these two very dynamic women, the club helped usher in the Equal Guardianship Act, the Deserted Wives Act, and legislation on both mother's allowances or mother's pensions and minimum wages for women. They didn't do this all alone, but they did lead the, the campaign. These in turn, uh, the, these pieces of legislation in turn became models for other um, provinces and, and uh, BC was really a leader in these areas. And I might also note that they both realized that their inability uh, at this time to, to vote put them at a disadvantage and McGill particularly um, joined the struggle for uh, women's suffrage. Um, Ferris was a little more lukewarm about that. Um, but of course, clubs did more than advocacy work. <clears throat> In the early years, university educated women were still a small minority, and many people considered them to be oddities, blue stockings and such. And as a result, many club members took pains to appear really respectable, so as not to give all of them a bad name. So they often confined their efforts to acceptable gender roles, such as education, culture, charitable work, and so on. They funded local libraries, supported the arts, worked with settlement houses, and raised money for scholarships. In the process, of course, they created a strong bond of friendship, which became a central focus to the university women's clubs and one that I would argue uh, has kept them strong. So let's look now at the Federation. Uh, more and more clubs were being formed, Edmonton, Cal uh, Regina, uh, Ottawa, for example. So it was time to form a federation. That happened in 1919, uh, just after the First World War, when at the same time an international federation was being proposed. The new um, uh, constitution for the Canadian Federation allowed clubs, which um, made up its membership rather than individuals, um, clubs were allowed a considerable amount of autonomy and that seems to be the case uh, to this day. The Federation, um, one of the first things the Federation did was to join IFUW, but it also made plans uh, to create a scholarship and it formed committees on both vocations and education and it established the Chronicle to, um, to communicate with its members. Margaret McWilliams was the first um, president. She um, was a U of T grad. She had studied political economy with um, future Prime Minister um, Mackenzie King. Um, as the uh, Federation's new president, she articulated its uh, philosophy, which held as a near sacred precept that education was a privilege. And it was one that came with a strong social obligation. Members should provide services to their communities, their families, and the nation. The organiz organization really believed that providing such service 
would prove their critics wrong, the ones who said that uh, educating women was a waste of resources. Some of them even believed that by demonstrating their competence, women could wear down entrench gender um, prejudices and uh, ultimately improve the status of women. One of the first things they did, uh, the Federation, was to establish a national uh, traveling scholarship. The first was um, awarded in 1921 for $1,000. The scholarship was meant to give women an advantage in gaining um, academic appointments or professorships. They wanted to see women become professors. Uh, the women who won these scholarships were exceptionally talented and ambitious, but their careers did not always live up to their potential. Marie Hearn um, did carve out a niche in genetics by collaborating with her husband and fellow scientist Hugh J. Creech. Constance McFarlane studied marine algae and eventually found a job in government becoming director of Seaweeds Division of the Nova Scotia Research Foundation from 1949 to 1970. Margaret Cameron was one of the few who um, obtained a teaching position. She was in the arts rather than science. She, she taught French at the University of uh, Saskatchewan. And like many um, scholarship uh, winners, she became a lifelong member of CFUW. The Federation was very, very proud of these women. They're very, they were very accomplished and they, they did report on them periodically in the Chronicle. There was even discussion of writing a collective biography of them for the um, Centennial, Canada Centennial in 1967 although this uh, never materialized. But they were disappointed that so few, the, the Federation that is, was disappointed that so few of them, despite being so exemplary in their academic qualifications, were able to gain academic posts. So in response, they established an academic appointments committee to advocate for them. In 1926, when Alice uh, e. Wilson, um, who was already a noted paleontologist working for the Geological Survey of Canada, was refused um, a period of leave to pursue a PhD. The CFUW um, came to her rescue and uh, they, they lobbied on her behalf and successfully. Leave was granted although it was on quite miserly terms compared to um, to what the men um, re usually received. And it, it actually took her three years to complete her PhD. But still, Wilson graciously called it a victory for women that would open doors in the civil service. In the 1930s, widespread unemployment led some Canadians to attack women, particularly married women, who were working for pay. CFUW also came to their defense, although that wasn't always a popular position. Although it was barely noticed by observers at the time, they were mostly concerned with male unemployment, women were experiencing their own economic hardships. Teachers found it difficult to find positions and even to keep them because in some cases they um, had to deal with pay cuts that unfairly targeted women. CFUW had from its the beginning had a vocations committee and their mandate was uh, to help women find jobs or volunteer work that was suited to their um, education. Um, they, um, CFUW in the late 30s joined with a, another group uh, at U of T and they formed a vocations bureau. It was under the direction of uh, True Davidson or Gertrude Davidson, who later became East York's iconic mayor. Hmm. 
The Bureau undertook uh, placement work for women graduates, tried to find them jobs. And they also tried to educate um, employers on <clears throat> what women could do, um, as they were finding that many educated women were really underutilized, um, you know, working as secretaries and, and so on. The Bureau, <clears throat> unfortunately, um, became unsustainable financially. But the Federation noted that it was important and it did important work and that the government should assume um, this important role. The government should start doing this. So it was not until after the war that the idea reemerged. And in the 1950s, which of course we know is supposed to have been the time of the domestic mystique and suburbia and the baby boom and so on, the, uh, during the 50s, the, the Federation teamed up with other women's organizations and persuaded the federal government to establish a women's bureau in the Department of Labor. It was established in 1954, initially with a modest um, research mandate, but it soon expanded and became an important um, government body that supported women's labor and even um, uh, did research toward uh, legislation in the areas of pay equity, important things. And CFUW was very, um, was delighted when a, a one of their members, Marion Royce, became its uh, first director. Most of you probably already know that CFUW was instrumental in the appointment of the Royal Commission on the Status of Women in 1967. It's definitely recognized as a watershed event in women's history. CFEW had been quietly advocating for decades, although it was largely falling on deaf ears, um, in part because of the depression and, uh, and war, um, their advocacy for, for women, that is. But by the 1960s, um, Canada was growing more prosperous and more married women were entering the workforce. Um, this is uh, Margaret McClellan. She was the first of two dynamic CFUW pres presidents in this decade. She had um, previously worked on the status of women issues at the international level. And she had made important uh, conceptual links between the rights of women and what was happening internationally in uh, human rights, you know, the Universal Declaration for Human Rights, which was signed just after the war and so on. Not everybody was making those connections at that time, but she did. During her term, um, McClellan began a study on uh, continuing education, which was meant to help women graduates re-enter the workforce if they wanted to. Laura Sabia followed her um, as president and uh, she completed that study. Sabia had already experimented with um, bringing together coalitions of women's groups on other issues. And then in the early 60s, she persuaded 30 women's organizations to join her in demanding that the Liberal government appoint a Royal Commission on the Status of Women. Her particular genius was in bringing together what she called the older group of established women's organizations, which she called the white uh, glove set, with the hobnail boot set, and by the, that she meant the, um, the new, younger, more militant uh, women's groups that were starting to form in this period. She was um, famously pressured by a reporter to um, to say what she would do if the government ignored her cry for a commission, her call for a commission. And she famously threatened to march 2 million women to Parliament Hill. Judy LaMarche, 
who was at that time the only woman in government, cre credited uh, this threat by um, Laura Sadia as being very effective. But I honestly think that um, Lamarche's quiet behind the scenes influence was equally important. They really made a good team. Sabia, uh, for her part, later admitted that she would have been hard pressed to convince two, let alone two million women march um, to Parliament um, on Parliament Hill. And she quipped, besides that, she hated marching and it was winter. So um, still, CFUW did play an important role in making the commission happen. And there's no denying its importance. It did impressive research, sometimes drawing on work uh, that CFUW had, and other women's organizations had already done. Um, it led to government advisory commissions being established on women's issues and forced governments to pay attention to women's demands. It also set out a roadmap for legislative change um, for many decades to come. In fact, Sabia left CFUW um, in order to lead the National Action Committee on the Status of Women, which was founded to pressure the government to implement um, the many recommendations by the commission. But the commission was not universally welcomed, at least not at first. The report of the Royal Commission came out in 1970. By then, uh, seated at the center here is uh, Margaret Orange. She had become the CFUW president. She chose to ignore the commission and stressed community service rather than women's status issues. In fact, it seems fairly clear she didn't think women's status needed to be raised. In fact, something which uh, most historians find amazing, and I certainly was astonished when I discovered this, CFUW did not even submit a brief to the, our, um, the Royal Commission, although about a half a dozen, um, at least a, probably a dozen clubs did, and one of them was Vancouver. This really puzzled me at first, but then I came to realize that it made sense when you looked at the divergent goals within the organization, which had always combined community service, members interest groups or learning with promoting uh, women's issues. Gwen Black was the next president after um, Strain, um, sorry, Orange, Margaret Orange. Uh, she seemed um, genuinely dismayed by the direction the new movement was taking, which was now starting to be called uh, Women's Liberation Movement. She felt that the new groups coming in onto the scene lacked a kind of foundation in a strong constitution that CFUW had. They didn't pay enough attention to process and they weren't careful in their research um, on resolutions which were all things that CFUW prided itself on. She labeled them, at least privately, um, to be radical or militant. Officially, CFUW called for advisory councils and human rights commissions, which, uh, which would and did, in fact, establish government machinery to address women's issues. And they were areas that uh, CFUW was comfortable dealing with. Despite new frictions within the growing women's movement, um, and you have to realize it went from nothing in the 30s to this huge, huge movement in the 60s. Um, the recommendations the commission made were not uh, at all dissimilar to much of CFUW policy um, as expressed through their resolutions over the years. Indeed, I looked and I could not find much difference other than in emphasis, particularly on the questions of abortion and childcare. Other than that, they were pretty much the same. Um, CFUW and CFUW made a great contribution in terms of uh, some of the research that went into the 
uh, to the study itself and also helping to lobby for uh, its implementations um, at local and provincial levels. The disagreements were largely over tone and method, not um, the material um, demands that they had made. Ruth Bell came to the presidency in 1973, and she provided what I like to call a rebound project, which uh, also coincided with International Women's Year. She launched the Foster the Roster campaign as one of, and it, it really drew on uh, one of the organization's major strengths, which was leadership. The idea wasn't new, but she expanded it by accessing the new government money that was floating around these days. Um, it built on um, it built on previous efforts that CFUW had already uh, undertaken to uh, get women appointed to um, academic positions on civil service, and uh, but she expanded it, uh, uh, particularly in, in the area of business. Um, the judiciary and government and so on. Um, she also launched a local campaign to eliminate sexist textbooks in schools, which really took off at the local level, and uh, to encourage more women to take math and science. This was a project that everybody could get behind. By the 1980s, <clears throat> CFEW had it kind of redefined itself as a moderate voice in public affairs. President Linda Souter, in the uh, red here in the, in the center, established a channel to government, and there were many regular consultations between CFUW and government. They, um, the organization continued to use its um, uh, strength in, co in creating coalitions um, and they, um, they did have uh, some highlights, some successes in the areas of uh, gun control and international treaty, an international treaty on landmines. In CFUW's coalitions uh, with other women's groups, they often provided quiet influence and political access through their, uh, their own social networks. Um, so Evelyn Ferris would have been proud of them. These uh, government meetings and delegations continued on for several decades, in fact. Uh, well, they're still going on. Um, in the upper right is a 1991 meeting, and some of you may recognize uh, Peggy Matheson from BC, who was the president then. They're meeting with Mary Collins, the um, Minister for uh, the Status of Women. And uh, on the lower picture, that's Mavis, uh, President Mavis Moore in, um, in the year 2000. Okay, so my last topic is on women in politics, CFUW in politics. Although uh, CFUW is officially nonpartisan, it has really done a lot to foster the careers of women politicians, whether intentionally or not, I don't know. BC's um, Laura Jameson was one of these. Some of you may already know about this new engaging biography written by BC historian Veronica Strong Bow, but if not, I recommend it. It's, it's quite a nice read. Uh, Jameson came from a, a modest farm background in Ontario. She was orphaned young. Her parents died of influenza, but she was ambitious and she worked hard um, as a teacher to fund her university education. She was a keen debater and she even liked, um, well, not surprisingly, a lot of CFEW women are uh, uh, ath athletic. She was... Um, she was a lover of fencing and skiing, for example. Uh, she married a prominent liberal in Vancouver and served as president of the Vancouver Club from 1915 to 1917. And I believe she worked with Ferris and McGill on the legal reforms. She was widowed in 1926 and then through experiencing the depression, she turned to, um, she turned to, the, uh, to the left politically and joined this 
uh, CCF, which of course later became NDP. Um, and she often lobbied for women workers. She was also a juvenile court judge, served on Vancouver City Council, and in uh, BC's Legislative Assembly from 39 to 45. And um, again, uh, from 52 to 53. Jameson um, was able to draw on her uh, contacts among club women for political support. And it's interesting because uh, she was much more feminist than many CFUW members but um, they still supported her. And within the CCF, on the other hand, she was seen as far too ladylike. So uh, clearly you can't please everyone. Um, and as uh, I've just thrown a few pictures together here to make my point that uh, CFUW women um, have joined the political arena um, on all sides of the, de the debate. Um, and I think that's because uh, CFEW's complex uh, process of establishing policy through uh, resolutions that are voted on at the AGMs, uh, members had to learn the machinery of government on a small scale. They certainly learned parliamentary debate rules how to craft an argument, how to draft legislation, and so on. So this resulted in um, a lot of uh, a lot of women uh, joining the political um, arena. Okay, um, so I'd like to finish by saying a few a few words again about uh, clubs and how important they are uh, as the foundation for the federation. Here, women continued to pursue, pursue many interests, um, including fundraising and interest uh, groups and community service. In some cases, of course, they acquired um, uh, clubhouses. In 1962, Vancouver joined Montreal, Toronto, and Winnipeg in acquiring this stately mansion and renovating and furnishing it. Um, in the 1920s, such efforts to build clubhouses or, or establish clubhouses were often centered on uh, international academic exchanges, but by this time they were more um, social, social centers, featuring things like Christmas at uh, Highcroft, for example. Um, over time, smaller towns and cities, of course, uh, started to form clubs, um, and many of the uh, major cities um, were divided, in, and the, the suburbs of major cities uh, developed or founded their own clubs. In BC, the Nanaimo Club was founded in 1945. One of their first projects was to raise money for displaced persons during the war. And your, uh, your club, Parksville Qualicum, was formed in 1981. And I believe there are now 21 um, clubs in BC and uh, six on the island. Clubs allow members to do the things that keep the organization cohesive. Having fun, playing bridge, holding book clubs and book sales, learning crafts, showcasing their uh, members' art, talents, and so on and so on. These core functions, which foster friendship and lifelong learning, have kept the organization alive and well after um, many other groups have floundered. Members often ask me how CFUW has compared, fared compared to other women's organization especially in this era of declining membership. And I would say that it has fared uh, quite well. Um, they haven't always been happy with their membership, but I, I don't think they've done that bad. Uh, women's organizations, for example, that were founded at the same time as the Royal Commission uh, have not survived because they only did advocacy. CFUW, um, I think is flourishing as well as and maybe better than many of the organizations 
such as National Council of Women um, that were founded at the same time as them or even earlier than them. And I think it's because they combine uh, advocacy for women's issues uh, with other goals uh, like friendship, community service, uh, lifelong learning. Um, and I, I think it's resulted in an organization that has uh, been very good at uh, managing the storms of change. And I, I would also say that um, being self-funded is a plus. So to, to summarize, CFUW members or founders, sorry, were inspiring and brave women. Many of them helped open the doors to Canadian universities. Some of them formed clubs, then a federation. Responding to the experiences of their own members, the Federation helped educated women find jobs and volunteer work suited to their education and talents, which was not a given. It was not easy to find that in the early days, especially. And they have done this consistently throughout 100 years of their, um, of their history. Despite all the setbacks, political change, uh, war, depression, and so on. Scholarships and the Vocations Bureau in the 30s led the organization to advocate for women in senior positions, culminating perhaps in the Foster the Roster campaign. And when the commission was launched through a CFUW initiative and had a somewhat rocky start, the organization found a new role as a moderate voice in a much uh, bigger uh, forum of uh, feminism. CFEW's diverse community projects, in fact, benefit a much larger group, uh, wider group than its own members, and its uh, influence has extended locally, provincially, and nationally. So you should be proud of your history. Thank you so much for um, letting me speak tonight. <laughs> uh, I want to thank Diane. That was very interesting. i uh, really interested to hear about the evolution and the impact that um, we've had. So it's great. Thanks a lot. You're, you're very welcome. <laughs> Are there any questions? Questions. Well, I'm not sure. I'm going to make a comment. You, yes, please. Um, you just helped me understand it um, better than I do now, and uh, all of the how formal it so much of it is is back when they started. If they didn't write things like a legal document, <laughs> they wouldn't be listened to. So, mm -hmm. so that makes it much clearer to me um, mm -hmm. um, on on that part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um I was amazed um at how how formal, especially you know the 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 first meeting I went to, they asked me to come and and speak to the AGM, the Centennial AGM, and I was amazed at how formal the whole resolution process was, and mm -hmm. how there was a parliamentarian there, and it was very strictly adhered to that um, you had to follow these rules of order. And I, I came into the feminist movement in the, the in the later period, and I was one of those militant, I was one of those militant groups that didn't didn't uh, didn't follow those strict orders. And um, so I found that I found that amazing. And um, but then I I started thinking about it and looking into it. And uh, apparently, um, I have a friend who who has studied the history of um, the. Um, women's christian temperance union and she said it was the same there and i think that it was because they felt they got a lot of criticism people said oh women can't decide on anything it'll just end up in a cat fight and that they won't uh, these women's organizations won't be able to to survive because women can't organize well they wanted to prove them wrong so they were very they were very strict about um following the right process and yeah. you know and it, it's also it, it, it's similar to what they did in terms of um being super respectable and and not not wanting to be too radical because they didn't want to give university women a bad name because yeah they, they did at first you know 
I thought it was one of the things I jotted down was that it was considered an evangelical um, church. I think maybe you said Baptist in 1870 yeah. that encouraged women to be educated. And we've done like a, a one <laughs> or a 360 on that one, I think, because now they're the groups that want women at home um, chained to the table. But <laughs> So I thought that was rather fascinating. I thought it'd be, I'd be interested. I think there were, I think there might've been um, a, a two strains. There might've been the, there were some more progressive evangelical Baptists yeah. and yeah. some more conservative. Yeah. And maybe and, they, uh, you know, I don't know what it, it's like now, but um, I don't think all Baptist churches would have been, would have taken that position, but, um, but the progressive ones did and that, that university did. And it would be the same today. Like there's such a different a wide spectrum yeah. of within yeah. every group. Yeah, so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so uh, Jacqueline has a question. Yes, I was just wondering. Um, hi, Diane. Nice to see you. Oh, hi, Jacqueline. How are you? <laughs> uh, um, yes, uh, incredible book that you put together here and, and the mm -hmm. research. And um, it, it makes me a, a value. Um, keeping our history together you know and i just wondered how you found that uh putting a book i don't know how long you had to put this together oh. but to, to to do the research and uh how yeah. you found that process oh well it it was um it, it probably took two years uh, when i started i was still working at parks but i was working part-time so i probably i put in more hours on the book than i did at work um, <laughs> and, then, and then and then i you know i did this as a retirement project because i didn't want to be bored when i was retired so i i certainly was not bored i was like chained to this computer for almost two years um and i and i and i felt like i only scratched the surface of it i i i went to the archives i looked at their records they have very good records uh, but I just didn't have time to read everything. I read mostly all the chronicles, so I got the overview picture, uh, but only in a few areas, um, like the, the the Royal Commission, for instance, did I actually look at a lot of their files. So I could have done more. Um, and I, I do hope that um, having having done this book that uh, other historians will look further. And, and I, I might mention too, I, I have, spoken to other historians and they feel that this is one of the few books that actually there are there's quite a bit of literature on the the the, the first what they call a first wave feminist movement of of the, the the suffrage era but a lot of that ends in you know the 20s or 30s and there is starting to be a little bit of literature now in the the 40s and 50s the wartime is, is sort of reasonably well covered but there isn't very much that takes you through in a whole organization past the 20s and 30s all the way up to the present. So I think this book does make a contribution in that regard. It, it helps us to see how this particular organization at least responded to all those changes because a lot happens. You know, there's the First World War and then there's a the Depression and then there's the Second World War. You know, they have to respond to a lot of uh, a lot of changes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, but um, it was. Uh, I wish I had more time. I, I you know, I, I could have done more. But uh, volume two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Well, there are a few. There are a few areas that I might like to uh, to delve into in in maybe some short articles. I I don't know. I'm I'm very interested in. Um, I didn't talk about it in this this talk because I, I wanted to focus on BC, but um, during the war, the war guest committee that was chaired by um, um, Alice Vibert Douglas, uh, it was part of a whole international movement to get um, refugees from Nazi Germany, women scholars, often many of them Jewish, um, out of the country and once out of the country helped them settle. And I'd like to look further at that because there's very little information about that. But it's a really fascinating story that these these women had enough faith to try to help them get out and uh, reestablish themselves and and continue to do their own uh, to, to to do their own research. So, but there's lots of other areas that people could further study. 
Well, I hope you pursue that. I think that would be a fascinating read. Nice. Yeah, I, I do intend to do that one. I'm not sure how much further I'll get. But, you know, a book like this, um, if it gets read by undergraduates in university, you, um, it may give some young historians ideas about what they could look into. And mm -hmm. that would be great. I'm, I'm hoping they do. It, I, I found it was very interesting that you said that the CFUW as a whole was often very disappointed about mm -hmm. the fact that their scholarship winners often yeah. didn't go ahead and become members. And we've, we've you know, that's one thing we we have today that it's it's difficult to get them interested. Mm -hmm. So, but we we carry on none, nonetheless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think Diane had her hand up. Yeah, the other just, Diane. <laughs> right. I was just wondering, Diane, if you if you've had any sense of the sort of the contemporary uh, trends for the CFUW. I mean, there's a lot of we see a lot of advocacy here, but I'm wondering is that is that something that you or were you not able to get any sense of what's going on now? Um, I tried to avoid what was going on now, personally. Um, as an historian, the closer you get to the present day, the harder it is to do history. It, it's just too, it's too recent and people are, are, you know, it's already going on and there's very, it's very hard to get perspective on what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. um, I know that they are continue, continuing to do advocacy work. Um, they had to make a lot of adapt, adaptations during the the Harper era, for instance, and then things changed again um, after that. And yeah. but um, it's too um, it's too recent to really uh, analyze for oh, me cool. anyway. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Bonnie, um, just a, a couple of comments, Diane. Your book's eminently readable. Oh, I thank really you. enjoyed it. Um, it's, it's dense. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot there. There is over a lot there. hundred years. I, I kept finding myself going back and forth, but but that was it's very very well done. Not to, not just the research, but the written end is wonderful. I was really interested to see the relationship that you drew between the Canadian Association for University Teachers when mm -hmm. you talked about that and women sort of yeah. streaming off differently because that's something I didn't didn't know anything about having worked at a university for half my career. Mm -hmm. That was, I never quite understood where that organization came from and what it did. And so it was interesting to pick up a little sidelight of that in the book, but yeah, so much. It was really well done. Mm, thank you. Yeah. I, you know, it's, uh, it's funny. I, um, throughout reading reading the sources they were they were always going on and on and on about we don't have enough members we don't have enough members and why aren't we attracting every single person who ever graduated from university and I have to say I got really tired of hearing this <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I I think I think they did pretty well to attract as many as they did and I and I do think you have to keep in mind that in the early early days, they might have been the only organization that was defending the right of, of of women in professional life. And then, as more and more women entered various professions, then their professional associations came along. You know, there'd be teacher association and dentist association, all these different organizations uh, that were eventually going to represent women as well as men. They were sometimes slow to represent women very well, but they did eventually. So they, there wasn't as much call for an organization like CFUW to defend women's professional um, ambitions because other people were doing it. And it, you know, that's just a measure of success really. Yeah, they, absolutely. They were the first to do it. You know, they got it started. So, yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, thank you again. So thank you, Diane. You're very welcome. And thank you for this lovely informal format. I so much like this better 
um, being able to see your faces when you're asking mm -hmm. questions. <laughs> I've done them before where it's been a much bigger group and someone just writes the question into the chat and then they tell you the question and it's this is much nicer. Oh, anyway. uh, before you go, we have, uh -huh. we have our newer member uh, raising, asking a question. So Tammy, are you still there? She was. Oh, yes, oh. sorry. Um, I, I didn't mean to ask a question, but I'll say hi. <laughs> it, was, it was wonderful. Thank you. That was I, it, my first meeting that I attended. It's so great to have this history presented. I learned a lot. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I'm glad yeah. you liked it. It was really well done. I'm glad you liked it. So um, shall I say good night and let you yes. do your business yes. meeting? Yes. Okay. Good morning for me. Thank you. Thank you're very so welcome. Thanks, Diane. Keep up the good work, ladies. You're doing great. Thank you. Thank bye you. bye.